Hey everybody, John here from Narcotic Casserole. So um, what you're seeing right now is the series of Saw reviews that I did in celebration of Saw 10 that came out last year. And I decided, what the heck, I did do a ranking video on TikTok, but to be dead honest, uh, firstly, I don't think the video was that great. And additionally, the video got flagged for content, which was weird because I appealed it and it the appeal I, I got the appeal, but for some reason, it didn't get the viewership I wanted, so I decided to leave the video and I decided, what the hell, let me just download all these and just um, and cut them all together and just post them on YouTube in the order to which I rank them. So uh, here you all are. Here's my ranking of the Saw franchise as of February the 29th, leap year of 2024. I may revise this down the line when Saw 11 comes out, but in the meantime, here you go. Watch it, don't watch it. The choice is yours. Fuck you! No! Game over. No! Saw 3D or Saw the Final Chapter or Saw 7. A uh, lot of things to be said about this one. And on a note of finality, I definitely feel it. Uh, but was it a satisfactory finale? I think that's up for debate. Um, the first major thing... I will say this one definitely felt a little mean-spirited, a little gaudy. Um, I would, and I think a lot of it really comes from the fact that they did it in 3D, and the 3D cameras and the film stock they used kind of made everything look a little superficial, a little stagey, which really kind of got in the way of the grittiness that usually tends to go hand in hand with this franchise. So, for as fun as 3D is, and what all the rage that it was when this movie was coming around, I don't think. I don't think it was used particularly well when it came to this particular movie. So, particular, particular, particular. Now, in terms of a finale, uh, there is some aspects that are satisfactory. I do actually like the big final, I guess you could say twist, and I do like the wrap-up for Hoffman. And I say wrap-up because we have no idea if anything happened afterwards with him. Uh, principally because by this point, I, I'm not saying I was getting tired of him, but I was really like, okay, fucker, you gotta die. And you know, at this point he definitely gets gets some kind of comeuppance. A very apt one at that. Well, I liked what they were alluding to, the idea that now that John Kramer is dead and gone, uh, and now that basically the person who is bes who was once an apprentice and is now effectively besmirching his legacy is now finally seeing his comeuppance, and the idea that John Kramer's work will continue on with disciples that he has indoctrinated. All that I feel was the springboard that they should have continued on with with the franchise. So that particular aspect of it, and, and the fact that this whole movie really did kind of feel like, you know, Hoffman's last stand is fine, but there's aspects of this movie that I thought felt were especially uh, unpleasant. And I would definitely say mean-spirited is the word, especially when it comes to the focal trap plot involving the guy who pretended to uh, be one of Jigsaw's victims and then having to go through his office. Now, first off, this is the time where I was actually looking at the scenarios going, uh, I don't think, I, I don't think that minute is more, is at all enough time. Even if the person actually goes and goes for it, like right out of the gate. I, I, I don't know. There's a part of me, I, there's a part of me thinking, Hoffman, did you just want them to die? And were you just getting prepped for that? But there were other kills uh, in the movie, well, there were some that I actually think, actually, the one I did think was winnable was the one where he was lifting and the stuff was like jabbing into his sides. I was like, this one, this was the one that actually had me going because I was like, this one, I feel like if the guy really holds out, he could go for it. But I will say, and I, I know a lot of people agree with me on this, uh, one of the things about Jigsaw is the idea that he does not punish the innocent. And unfortunately, when it comes to this guy and his wife, that's what happens here. And I think that's nothing, I just did not sit right with me. The fact that she ends up getting baked in an oven because her husband's a douche. And I'm like, that's, that really doesn't seem like what something Jigsaw would, like as John Kramer would do. I feel like this is all Hoffman just being a full blown dick, dickweed. Now, in terms of storytelling, at least the resolution is something where I can happily say, yeah, sounds about right, and could springboard into something better. Something that which they still could do as time goes on. But in terms of entertainment value, in terms of plot of plot progression, it just 
didn't really sit right with me. Now, if you're if you're in the game, if you're in this movie just for the traps, some of them are very impressive, and some are pretty damn wild. I'll definitely say the one with the uh, white supremacists in the garage. That one, that that was one naturally I wanted to see come to fruition because it's a bunch of fucking Trump supporters. So of course I wanted to see them get theirs. So yeah, go. And yes, I know the movie came out before that, but let's face it, they would have. They would have voted that way. <laughs> Jigsaw. This time directed by the Spirit Brothers, who did Daybreakers, which is a fantastic vampire film for anyone who has not seen it yet. But this one was very clearly meant to be some kind of soft reboot type thing. Um, I don't know what their full intention was. Uh, when I got to the conclusion of it, it seemed like they could have, I don't know, maybe continued on with the plot threads of Saw 7. I know they said that, it, you know, Saw 7's the finale, Saw 7's the finale, but it's like a finale implies finality. So why don't you, but the ending of Saw 7 did not hint at finality. So if Jigsaw was just meant to continue the story, why didn't they just continue it on from there? And that's kind of the weird thing about this movie. Now, the sad part is the twist could work. The twist could have some merit, and I will say the Spirit Brothers, because they are very competent filmmakers and have done excellent work, they do a great job of juggling the narratives to make you think, you know, to delude you into thinking what you're seeing is, you know, pure and simple what you're meant to see. And I will say the twist is delivered very competently on a scripting level. Um, I will say when you get to the reveal, you are definitely going to be questioning some logic, especially if you were alive to know what technology was available at certain time periods, especially when this franchise first kicked off. So this is one of those times you really kind of find yourself poking holes. I mean, we know that Jigsaw is a engineering genius, but to the point where he created many sort of bits of technology before anyone else did. Not so much. Now, I'm pick, I'm picking apart the film. I mean, yeah, these are logic gaps that are really hard to surmount. But the enjoyability of the movie is still there. A lot of the traps are still pretty damn great. Even if a lot of them are reliant on some CGI. But it's still worth it because it segues into you seeing things that you don't normally get a chance to see. Definitely the... Uh, surgical laser collar pays off because admittedly the sick part of myself you know sees that and going like man I actually really want to see this come to fruition I want to see what happens here and um, you you see it and it's kind of awesome you know even with the use of CGI it just works so if you are just here to see some kick-ass saw traps you are definitely not going to be disappointed there are some good ones in this one so the entertainment value of this movie is there and even if you and it is easy for me to kind of just ignore uh the continuity implications of the big twist because i actually was uh interested in our focal characters who are caught in this series of traps especially the um the lead uh, what we think is going to be a heroine uh she is definitely one that you're rooting that they do a great job making you root for this person until you get to the final twist about her character and not gonna lie i was pretty damn shocked and i really really dug it because i love it when a movie makes you think some one thing about a character and makes you invest in your feelings towards a character and then they hit you with something so late in the game that it just blow it just makes you go oh man oh and you get played and to its credit the route that the trap story goes does not there are many surprises in it and i was actually very delighted about that <laughs> Hey, look at that. I'm talking about a horror movie called Spiral, and it's actually not about the movie Spiral. Though, everyone should be talking about that movie, because it's really freaking good. Spiral, from the Book of Saw, that was that was uh, directed by returning director Darren Lynn Bowsman. Uh, this one's starring Chris Rock, uh, and also guest appearance by Samuel L. Jackson. They have an idea, 
and they have an, uh, a notion of what to do to prolong the franchise beyond the boundaries of where it was, especially in the aftermath of Jigsaw, which really swung for the fences in terms of trying to find a way to perpetuate the series. And for Spiral, for the Book of Saw, this one actually kind of got back to being something of a police procedural. And it was interesting, the idea that, that it was delving into uh, police corruption. And I will say, even though the reveal of who uh, this killer act actually is is fascinating but it's also kind of obvious so uh, you're not really kind of you know agog about the twist of the movie I will say the ending is great but ultimately you're still left with this mm, I feel like we could have built up to this a little bit more and it's a shame because I really liked where their head was at with spiral I like the idea because obviously you just can't keep perpetuating John Kramer I mean, yeah, and his machinations could only have gone so far. Personally, I, I would have liked to have thought that the idea of Jigsaw, like his ultimate end game, was that he created something of a new religion, like, kind of like around himself, like the idea that he's like some kind of prophet and that he had this kind of cult of followers or he kind of created this cult of people who believed what he believed in terms of people embracing life. And it would have been legit fascinating if the killer in question in Spiral was one of those. Uh, maybe we could have used another movie in the direct Saw canon to kind of segue into this. I mean, Jigsaw kind of alluded to it, but it still didn't really, it just felt like it was just going to do more of the same. I feel like if we had done one more Saw movie, like one more official Saw movie, hinting at the idea that the ultimate end game is to spread the gospel and have other people follow by example, then this movie would have made so much more sense. Now, this one is actually still a good watch anyway, because it is fun seeing Chris Rock play against type, actually trying to play it a heck of a lot more serious. I actually did buy him uh, as a lead in this movie. I actually was very compelled by his arc. Um, and I really did, and I was actually rooting, rooting for him consistently all the way through. So it's an engaging movie. And while I do like the aspiration of it to try to take the story beyond the boundaries of Saw, I feel like it may have jumped a step ahead before we could really get a chance to uh, enjoy what they're trying to do here. So this is just goes to show some sometimes a good idea needs time to mature before you actually act on it. When it comes to TV series, how they have those seasons that you don't really feel like anything actually happened during the course of a season, but then you get to the next season and you realize, oh crap, it was leading up to this. That's kind of where I put Saw 4. Saw 4, I kind of feel like is a transitional movie where uh, it's necessary to tell this part of the story in order to get from part A to part C. Uh, that's really kind of where I feel this one lands to. And yeah, in many ways, this is, this is the truth because this is where we find out, this is where we get the big reveal, spoiler, that Hoffman is the new apprentice. This is where uh, we're wondering, you know, how the hell is Jigsaw still doing all this, even though we know that he's dead. And I will applaud this. Uh, the opening couple minutes of the base of the cold open of the movie where we actually just watch John Kramer's autopsy in vivid detail is fantastic because uh, the audience, of course, is always going to keep going. How the fuck is he still alive? How is he still able to do all this? And it's like, well, that he's obviously not dead. And it's like, nope. You're seeing him, his body on the slab. They are positively identifying it. He is bona fide dead, and and that and the autopsy goes into such vivid detail that there's no way you could possibly debate it. So there is a great sense of intrigue going on here. But all the way through, as I was watching for the first time, I'm like going, okay, this is all an aid to for a big reveal to in order to secure the future of the franchise from this point onwards. That's kind of how I felt because. Uh, while we do, I mean, we do have a better, a good focus since it does actually focus a lot strictly on uh, to, on Rig and his endeavor to try to uh, save Matthews. It's funny that they come up with all these little things about his character, uh, and it's hilarious because in the prior films, you never really got the this vibe about his character until 
they just spoon feed you oh this is his character quirk and that's the character quirk that's going to carry him all you know that that's the thing it's the entire thing's going to be based on so it's clear that they are doing this to just carry the story forward that's really my ultimately that's what it all boils down to now when it comes to the traps i will say this there are some you know some great trap moments here there are some that are uh a little simple i mean the one where the couple are are uh speared together uh nothing really elaborate about that and i would even say a little crudely put together when you take into account that one of the um the examiners, you know, the crime scene investigators, gets a dart in her face. I was like, was that really Jigsaw doing, or was that just pure and simple dumbasses in 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 action? I yeah, I don't know. Uh, that just kind of cracked me. I was like, going that that I'm not blaming Jigsaw on that. I'm not blaming Jigsaw or the Apprentice on that. Now, now the finale of it. Now, I mean, the twist is comparatively. I mean, the big twist, of course, is who is the new Apprentice. I mean, even though you can kind of guess it in many ways they kind of played played the same twist that they did in saw too so yeah i mean it's it's definitely one that i just watch just mainly if i intend to do a binge and just from one side to another but it's definitely if whenever it's like when i'm in the mood it's not going to be the one that i ever start watching again i mean i will give uh the finale has some great moments i will say you know i've never never known in my life that i was ever going to see someone's uh Breakfruit gets smashed by a pair of uh, ice blocks. I mean, I definitely did not see that coming, but suffice to say, I have, and it's pretty damn awesome. It's about as awesome as you can imagine it to be. But overall, um, overall, the film really does leave a lot to be desired. There are a lot of things, and again, because it's all in aid of setting up stuff that's going to pay off a lot more down, down the line. This is where we really get to meet Jill Tuck. This is where... Uh, we get to meet a lot of the people who are going to be major players down the line, such as Agent Strom. Uh, and we're going to see how all of this, or it's going to like set up the pieces for what we're going to get afterwards. But by and large, Saw 4 is just there by necessity. <laughs> Saw 5. This time, Hoffman is out. We know all about him being the other apprentice. And now we are seeing a cat and mouse between himself and Agent Strom. Will Agent Strom be able to get one over on him? Come on, buddy. We know. Yes. Um, <clears throat> where the fourth film, well, we'll get a little bit more of what we talked about the fourth film later on. This one I felt was much more a uh, complete film because this time now there's no more element of surprise. Now we get a chance to see who this person is we get to see how he came to be in the employ of jigsaw we even kind of get a little inkling of the way he works compared to either amanda or even uh john kramer himself so this one does give us the opportunity to really kind of see how they work but also uh it actually gives us a really good opportunity as well to really get to know the character of jill tuck um to really kind of see her side of her side of the whole affair but even that and well, with this one, though, I will say the side story, uh, the side plot involving the traps, uh, specifically the all the people involved with the uh, arson gone wrong kind of thing. Um, this this one, unlike the sixth one, where I feel they really do tie in, tie together a heck of a lot better, I kind of feel Saw 5 feels like two separate movies going on at the same time. Fortunately, both movies are still really interesting to watch. And... Let's focus on the trap plot. Uh, I will say that is definitely the more entertaining side of the film, principally because of the fact that when you hit the final twist, when you get to that final thing with the uh, with the buzz with the circular saw and putting your hands in, just knowing, and this is the thing I actually really love about Saw a lot of times is when he gives you that you know breakdown at the beginning of the game. And how John Kramer will actually give you the hint, a very significant, and in some cases a very obvious hint, of how to succeed. And it completely goes over the heads of his victims-to-be. And the funniest aspect of this one is the fact that they could have actually won this and practically walked away, you know, I wouldn't say in one piece, but definitely... Uh, to the point where they could actually probably heal from it if they actually 
worked together and that's all it took they just had to work together in order to survive all the traps and that's the funniest damn part of the resolution and i kind of really dig it for that is the idea that jigsaw is you know is aware of the darker natures of each of these people and is actually begging them guys please love a god your instincts are always going to be wrong please do the opposite of what your gut tells you or else your guts are going to be all over the place. Look what happens. Now, as for the Hoffman plot line, I mean, again, we do get a great cat and mouse thing going on. And I will say Costas Mandalore is definitely a force to be reckoned with. I mean, I do know a lot of people who love Hoffman just for the simple fact that he is a ruthless motherfucker. Um, and that's great. That's entertaining. And I will say he is cunning as hell, especially when it comes to outmaneuvering uh, Strom. And I will say the final ending, the final twist... And actually, I suppose the one way that the trap plot and the Hoffman plot kind of intersect is that both of them are, you know, pretty, the reason why both those traps end up springing is because these people, both people, including Agent Strom, they are going, they're just following their instincts and their instincts are leading them to their demise because they are so hell-bent that they don't stop to think of, to think of the common sense solution. Of it, so I think that's kind of what they're going for. I think the trap plot's kind of meant to be kind of like an overall moral to hit home what is going to be the catalyst to um, to Strom's demise. And I will say, uh, most of the time in movies, you know, you always see people in the scenario of the shrinking room, and nine times out of ten, they usually get out of it. So this was actually one of the rare times it was actually kind of wild to see someone legit die this way, and. Yeah, I mean, it was as gnarly as I expected it, even down to a pretty damn groan-inducing, you know, bone breakage portion of it. So, yeah, Saw 5 is definitely, I would definitely say it's a lot better than Saw, Saw 4, but um, I think just the fact that it just, it didn't connect as well as uh, Saw 6 or a lot of the other entries in the, in the franchise, uh, but it's still definitely an entertaining watch, but definitely more of a, you know, just more of a kind of nice placeholder to get into the better films. <laughs> yes, we're moving on to Saw 3, or as uh, other vastly more successful YouTubers will call it, the one with slow-ass motherfucking Jeff. Yeah, this is the one with Jeff. Jeff, you're so damn special. Now, the thing that cracks me up is the fact that Jeff is very compellingly played uh, by actor, I believe it's Angus McFadden, who and is a wonderful character actor. And if you have not seen him in other movies, I strongly recommend it. My favorite performance he gave was when he played Orson Welles in a film called Critical Rock, which he was outstanding in. Uh, so it was fun. So he is really acting his heart out with this movie. He is really doing his damnedest to deliver a compelling performance. I think the fault really lies in just the direction. And again, I'm not, I don't want to fault Darren Lynn Bowsman. He's he's doing another another great job, you know, mounting a saw movie. But why why is Jeff just dragging his fucking feet from most of these scenarios that he's being dealt with? It's just infuriating. Anyway, yes, like I said, better people than me have made constant jokes about slow ass motherfucking Jeff, and I will leave it to them. Let's just get into the meat and bones of Saw Three. Now, when I watched Saw Three originally, I I did like it. I did feel that there's a lot of aspects to it that were very compelling. Uh, specifically, everything involving um, Kramer, uh, the doctor he kidnaps, and of course uh, Mandy Young. And I like that we have this whole thing going on with Mandy Young, where uh, you find out that she's been rigging traps to be to that you that they can't escape them. And you're wondering why is she doing that? Why is she doing something very much obviously against Kramer's wishes? And I will say, watching it on first glance alone, and leading to the finale where Amanda comes to you know is saying, "No one changes. You know this doesn't work. It's not how you know these people just need to be punished flat out." That you know, I was like okay, I can kind of see where she's coming from. I mean, especially after they've had the Saw 2, you know, it's easy to be, but it still didn't feel right. But then 
this is kind of what I call the River Song Syndrome. Now, for those who are Doctor Who fans, you know, when we first met River Song, we didn't know Jack about her. We just knew that this scene, as it resolved, was something very powerful that could be very powerful if we knew more going in. And then, as time went on, we did find out about her. And then when you go back and watch that episode, it hits differently. I think Saw 3 is a movie that benefits greatly with, with time and with hindsight. Because after Saw 3, we find out some revelations about what really went on and what, what provoked the events that occurred in Saw 3. And beyond that, uh, Saw 10 is another one that really helped to enhance Saw 3 because Saw 10 took the time for us to really um, understand the bond between Kramer and Amanda and how le and I will say after watching Saw 10 and then going back there's a no there's a swell of emotion that came within me because I see that this is this did not come easy for Amanda what she does at the end of this movie is so obviously came so much more painfully to her because she's doing it under and, and because of what the real reason and as I said before the real reason is what makes me fucking hate Hoffman a lot more but you know if you know you know aside from Jeff the now if you're just in it for the traps there are some damn good ones in this one I mean of course this is the one famous for the uh, you know for the uh, broken the broken crucifixion one I don't know if there's an actual name for it but that one uh, if you're the kind of people who don't like limbs being torn in or pulled in different directions yeah this is the one that does that and uh, I, I think I've just gotten used to it at this point, so I, I was able to handle it fine. I was just more like just in awe of just how hardcore this trap is and definitely why it's widely there to be like one of the most memorable. And But ultimately what cracks me up is the na is who's in the trap and how at the tail end it just fucks this up so horribly and all he could do is scream, I rock you! And it's like, oh yeah, motherfucker, I'm glad I've had that while I'm with the last two seconds of my t last two painful fucking seconds of my life oh fucking Jeff man where all that leads to it does lead to a worthy finale granted now for those who know this is where Kramer officially dies did we really need it need him to die by by Jeff's hand really I, I can think of more worthy people to punch Kramer's ticket, not Jeff. Even then, I would never want to die by someone named Jeff. Like Jeff. You know, how'd that guy die? Oh, Jeff killed him. Fucking Jeff. How are you supposed to be a strong, thrilling, powerful warrior and lover with a name like Jeff? It is like a weak ejaculation. Okay. <laughs> Jeff. Okay. Ah! Aside from continuing on the whole story, uh, especially kicking off in spectacular fashion from the end of Saw 5, this film actually wanted to say something and actually says something in its own spectacular jigsaw-y kind of way uh, with the whole subplot surrounding uh, life insurance and the idea of how uh, corporations usually tend to only think of humanity in strictly algorithmic terms. And this isn't just about insurance, this is just about corporations in general and the idea about how uh, pretty much in order for corporations in order to produce products they only sum human nature up to numbers and how they uh, only play the averages in order to uh, in order to serve people and as a result that ends up leaving a lot of people out in the cold and leaving them uh, out in the lurch when it comes to the time when they actually need them and I love the fact that the writers really took the opportunity to use what was going on with uh, John Kramer and with Jigsaw to, uh, to use it as a means to actually talk about this subject and even better is that the whole side of the story involving uh, the traps and involving the uh, focal victim there's not a single trap that doesn't land in that entire in the entire film and of course this is the one famous for the uh, gun shotgun carousel which I will say easily is the one that is the perfect jigsaw mindfuck and the one that 
you know, I don't care who you are. If you had to be put in that, put in the position to have to make that decision, what the fuck would you do? I mean, I'm pretty sure there are people in this, and I got to give it to the guys that the fact that he actually was willing to make the sacrifice to at least save two of them. I'm pretty sure there are some people uh, on his level of power who probably wouldn't even bother. Period. But it was still such a, a brilliant, harrowing experience, and I think I love it because you even think about yourself in that. Uh, scenario and you have to think to yourself is uh, of, of the six people that are in that carousel who are the people who you yourself uh, would make this sacrifice in order to save and I kind of and that's another thing I really do dig about uh, you know saw and especially about the traps um, I think the reason why a lot of people are reversed to torture porn is because they think uh, that they envision themselves in that scenario and they think about what like how far they would go to save themselves in that scenario because there are some people who talk tough and being all like oh man yeah i do that no problem uh but then there are people who would just be like i would faint i would let myself die and i love that this one in particular especially the shotgun trap i i myself I, i'd like to think that i would be willing to make the sacrifice but even then i would don't know how i'd be able to handle the mind fuck of being able to make the decision of who among that six is going to make it out. And it's a riveting sequence. It's great. And it's one that I understand why people put that among the greats when it comes to the great saw traps. But even better, I also love how the whole trap uh, side of the story plays out. And the twist is delicious. I mean, it's one that... Uh, I'm pretty sure you would not see this particular twist coming, mainly because they orchestrated just right uh, in order to make you think it's going to be one way to resolve, but then goes the drastic way, the different way. And then when you see that twist, you're just immediately like, man, this is really the only way it was going to go, and I should have saw it coming. And I just was here for it. I was just electrified. Um, meanwhile, on the other side of the plot, you have Hoffman, uh, of course, dealing with uh, the fallout from his incrimination of Strom, uh, framing him, but now he has to deal with cleaning up the pieces, tying up the loose ends, and seeing that that is not going to be as easy as he thought, particularly when a new puzzle piece uh, is thrown into his lap that he wasn't expecting. And all the while, you have Jill Tuck also kind of strategizing her own position on the matter. I kind of wish a lot of things, I, I wish Hoffman ended here. I do kind of wish that, principally because, you know, seeing how things transpire in Saw 7, it just really kind of feels like, uh, and additionally, just because I, I kind of sympathize a heck of a lot more with Jill Tuck as a character, and I really would have enjoyed Saw 7, I think, if it focused on her, and to see how far she was, you know, willing to go in order to protect herself. And it just really kind of... I think that's the only thing I kept this one from perfection for me was the fact that I really would have preferred to see Hoffman's story end here. But that's really it. Uh, by and large, Saw 6 is one that I think is actually very tightly uh, paced. Uh, both plots uh, involving Hoffman and involving the insurance really do balance out nicely. Uh, both of them come to, I mean, one one comes to an incredibly satisfying conclusion. One comes to a a conclusion, one that I'm sure a lot of people would debate me on whether or not it was good or not. <laughs> this original film came out in 2004, 20 years ago, people. 20 years. The Saw franchise is 20 years you know, old today, which is kind of awesome that we are getting another installment this year. So let's really think about that. Let's think about the fact that two decades have passed since uh, Jigsaw first entered into all of our lives and almost single-handedly uh, created a br or at the very least brought to the forefront a new subgenre of horror uh, during a time when people accused it of stagnating and they came in in a big way and even funnier is that this movie uh, started what was known to be the torture porn movement which I will say um, the, a lot of the directors who have been associated with this subgenre kind of look at it with a bit of resentment because their intention was not to make something that people could get off on, but more that they wanted to um, generate a, or kind of create a different type of fear that had up to this point had not really been 100% uh, exploited 
in film, specifically the fear of pain. And that's really where the Saw franchise really stuck out. And then uh, people that followed like, you know, Eli Roth when he did Hostel uh, is a good example, but it's the idea of in invoking a part of people's imaginations to create what I know as phantom pains, but the idea of ima people forcing people to imagine what kind of agony the characters on screen are suffering from, and people and people's imaginations are firing up so hard that they themselves are feeling that agony, and that's where the Saw franchise really succeeded in. But I gotta celebrate the original for the fact that despite that, most most of the the moments are actually off screen really the only time you ever see any kind of moment where a character is in living agony is the finale of the movie with uh dr gordon cutting off his own foot that's in the trailer it's not a spoiler so to think that a lot of what was in a lot of those moments are implied in this film the fact that it's all of it's done post-mortem they just, you know, kind of give you little glimpses of what the character, what the victims may have suffered because of Jigsaw's machinations. It's the, the fact that this whole movie is a much more minimalistic affair than I think people really know. In a way, it's kind of like it really does follow in the footsteps of Texas Chainsaw Massacre, where they imply the gore and they imply um, all the things that you're seeing on screen. And because of that, and they do so do it so well that it makes it makes people just fill in the blanks with their own mind and because of that the film is much is incredibly more potent this was james wan's first film both him and lee winnell they both made this film uh after a proof of concept short film that they made to show what they had in mind but even then this was their first film and you really do kind of see the seams of it but with that also came a new style of filmmaking uh that became immensely popular sometimes to nauseating effect uh, down the line, but a lot of those crazy jump cuts and a lot of the sped up um, editing, a lot of that came about as a way to kind of hide the seams of the low budget nature of the film. And nowadays, if you're savvy, you can pick up on that. And especially when you look at uh, very haphazardly edited and shot car, you know, car chase scenes, and a lot of sets that some sets that may look a little uh, stagey, and even if they were like location the way it's lit does make it give it kind of a stagey edge but fortunately the potency of the film never is lost by the fact that they have the central premise of two guys waking up in a derelict bathroom and they play that to the peak of its of a peak of its ability and also on a narrative level is one that uh only a couple other filmmakers were experimenting with at the time you know and uh, the fact that while we're seeing this whole A story unfold, we're seeing flashbacks or stuff that we think is flashbacks, but then realizing everything here is running parallel. A lot of things that we would become very familiar with as the Saw franchise goes on was kicked off here and done so to great effect. Um, and it's more than enough to kind of forgive some of the shortcomings, such as the fact that, you know, James Wan never really took into account uh, certain accents or never or obviously wasn't didn't have an ear to pinpoint when Carrie always was slipping in his uh his accent the funny thing is for years he's done american characters and i was always like i i he a lot of times he did it so well i was always like are you english or are you even when i met the man it seemed like he was doing an american accent so i was i was never 100 percent sure is what's that's a mystery is Carrie always english or american we'll never know but <laughs> but also the fact that James Wan may, it was still kind of finding himself in terms of what, and same thing with Lee Winnell, uh, with what constitutes a really good performance, because we also have got Lee Winnell in his side of the performance, which, while it's great for this movie, especially with the soap opera melodrama that would come, fits perfectly, but even then, it's still a touch shaky. Um, so, but for two novice directors who are making their first movie and honestly get being lucky enough to land a lot of the talent that they did for this movie they still make a really strong impression <laughs> i got emotions i got feels and they came from a saw movie saw 10 takes place between saws one and two and spoiler after Jigsaw.
if you know you know but uh, this one now I'm gonna warn now there's a couple things we have to tell you about this firstly while it does have some twists and turns uh, throughout the course of the story this movie is actually not interested in that element of saw yeah it does have a customary twist at the very end but it's not as gargantuan as the road it takes to lead to that point the thing that surprises the hell out of me about this movie is the fact that everyone concerned are very clearly interested in telling a poignant emotional story yeah you heard me right the one thing that took me about this one is the fact that it is so much more interested in getting you invested in our our main characters Tobin Bell and Shawnee Smith this I think is one of this is some of their crown and glory in the entire franchise Tobin Bell delivers a powerhouse performance he is taking full center stage not just flashbacks anymore he is the point of focus all throughout and Shawnee Smith at the second she arrives on the scene it becomes their movie if you're gonna do a prequel you gotta have a reason to do it you gotta surprise us in one aspect or you gotta do it in order to enrich something now this one now they attempted to do this again with jigsaw with mixed results <laughs> and because their interest was strictly for the sake of enriching the characters that's where this movie shines above all and if you love John Kramer and if you love Amanda Young you are I guarantee you, there's gonna be one moment that is gonna get you either choked up or flat out uh, squirting some because frankly it's a beautiful there are some beautiful moments between these two characters now of course for a lot of people that's not what you hear or saw how are the traps how is the gore uh, firstly there is one trap where normally they this would be like a cheap tactic and they go oh lame but it's done with there's a lot of there's actually some humor in this one this one's actually got got the jokes and a lot of the jokes remarkably land and one of the traps ends up leading to something of a fake out which normally I'd say oh lame but the way they play it really got me going and it happens really early in the movie so it kind of feels right that they did it the way they did and again it also tracks for the character and the way it works but then when we actually get into the focal story um, when we get to the focal story with all the with all the uh, intended trap victims it does not disappoint on that front either there are a couple of gnarly ones and it does not flinch it does not hold anything back and you, now my sadistic ass was kind of laughing my butt off and the other cool thing about this one is that all the intended victim characters because this movie actually unlike a lot of the other Saw films this one actually gets us to know these characters before they're even in the predicament so when we actually see them as the the real game starts you actually have find yourself going yeah you fucking know why you're here you fucking know you fucking know. and it actually kind of gets you riled up even more because simultaneously you're like you really want to see some of these people get theirs but there's little aspects to some of them that make you go uh. and even better because this takes place when it does uh, you actually see Amanda Young kind of react based on some of the characters again I'm being spoiler free as possible this was such a ride I had such a great time with this uh, firstly it's uh, directed by one of the returning directors from the, one of the directors of previous installments so it does have a classic feel it even hilariously does a lot of those uh, visual flourishes that were popular around the time when Saw first came out and I loved it because it kind of made it feel like it was one of the franchise again so if you love the Saw movies I would frankly be shocked if you did not love this one as much as I did <laughs> Saw 2 this this film came out like about a year afterwards the first Saw kind of took the entire world by storm so a sequel is not only inevitable but what would transpire after this one broke the bank was something I don't think anyone anticipated in my opinion Saw 2 achieved what the first one did but bigger and in my opinion just a bit better and a lot of it really does have to do with the fact that it's a bigger story a lot more characters and a lot more crazier scenarios and even to it and this one not only did it have twists it had twists upon twists upon twists that all paid off in spectacular fashion and were 
stuff was stuff that really laid the groundwork for what was to come afterwards. Uh, this one just when I finally did sit down and start my binge proper after rewatching the first film, I knew that th that things were going to escalate significantly on the you know from here on in. I just and here there were some things in this movie. Here's the thing: I knew what was going to go down in a lot of aspects of this movie, especially when it came to the traps, because. Uh, one notorious thing about Saw is the traps, and a lot of things that keep people away from watching it are those traps. And when you have scenes like someone being thrown into a pool of syringes, yeah, I can see you. you the, those are the times where you, it's really hard to refute people's claims of, oh, oh God, I can't watch that. Because, yeah, when I saw that syringe pit sequence, uh, the thing that really makes that sequence work isn't just the visual and the fact that Shawnee Smith is selling the shit out of her agony in that sequence, uh, but the other thing that really, really works is the fact that the sound effects editing is so good, where you're hearing little tinkling noises uh, in it that just kind of make it... It's kind of like that, that weird little string that plays whenever a shit ton of bugs are around. But it's kind of like that where there's this little tinkling noise that really just gets under your skin. This is one of those phantom pain inducing moments in the movie that just really kind of stand out for me. But the other aspect of this, now some people have actually credited that the escape room uh, fascination really kind of came about because of Saw. And if there's any movie in the series that I really think kind of, you know, proves that point would be Saw 2, especially the notion of a whole bunch of people uh, waking up in a place they don't know and having to work together in order to crack the codes and figure out how to get, get through. And also another thing about this movie is that it does kind of lay a lot of the groundwork in terms of what you're going to kind of see when it comes to the people who are in the traps and how they function and how Jigsaw never, ever, you know, he he tells them just what they need to know in order to survive, but it's just through the people's natural flaws that they end up meeting their fate because they don't work together, because they don't listen. That's kind of these are the lessons that Jigsaw is trying to take. He's not doing this gratuitously. I think this is the one where really the you know the whole thing about Jigsaw's philosophy really comes out, uh, or really comes out and makes people kind of cringe or more. Cringe was just more, oh, he's on this shit again. Listen, John Kramer is not a person, he's, the whole thing about his whole, his logic and his philosophy, it, of course, it's flawed. It's absolutely flawed. Look what he's doing with it. He's, to he's capturing people, kidnapping them, and putting them in death traps. This is not the mind, this is not the functions of a healthy individual physically or mentally no there's of course there's flaws in the logic and the thing about the saw movies which i love is the fact that there are characters in each of the movies that actually are arguing against it there the whole point of it being a flawed logic is so that way there are characters who can debate the logic that's the fun of it you know, and there are times throughout the course of the franchise where you do kind of agree with Kramer. I would definitely say Saw 10. I totally agree with him on that shit. But there are times where I'm going like, uh, yeah, this was, you were kind of out of line on this one. But that's kind of the joy of the Saw franchise. And Saw 2 is the first one that really kind of brings the argument front and center, especially with all the great scenes with Tobin Bell and with, uh, one of the Wahlbergs. I think it was Donnie Wahlberg. Yeah, Donnie Wahlberg as as Detective Matthews as they're having their little back and forth sitting at the table. And again, these characters' innate flaws are what bring their downfall. Jigsaw sits there and tells them exactly what they need to do and it's just because they're flaws they don't listen. And it's just hilarious when you get to their to some of their endings and you're like going, fucker, you really, really just need to learn to listen. And it's hilarious for it. But it all leads to a spectacular finale. A twist, actually, a twist upon a twist upon a twist, which I would say definitely rivals the twist from the, I would even say in some cases dwarfs it. Because this is the, also the first time the franchise starts uh, dabbling in um, in time, time bending uh, narrative progression where you see one part of the story and they don't really tell you when that's taking place. The, uh, my understanding of why people love this franchise started to click and I was like realizing this is the joy of the franchise. 
and everything I love about it is in here. It's the one that I have gone back to and I love it. I it's it's the one I kind of and it's one that really does stand up to rewatch because again you're just kind of giggling because you know what's going down and you're laughing because you're like fucker you real he laid it all out for you right there and that's the joy ah! Ah! game over ah!